We've had several hundred people on over the last several hours. We've covered quite a cross section of topics um, and uh, we're just making sure that we're doing our own uh, continuous learning here. And so we appreciate that we've got joining us Nigel Jacob, who's a senior fellow at the Burns Center for Global Impact at Northeastern. And he's the Emeritus Emeritus, Emeritus co-chair and co-founder of the Marriage Office for New Urban Mechanics. And I always remind him he is, of course, a proud Canadian um, from um, right around the, the GTA. Annika Smith, who's uh, the director of the uh, Center for Cities at the Faculty of Law at the University of Windsor. Uh, Shauna Sylvester from the WASC Center, uh, the ED there, and um, uh, from the Center for Dialogue. And also many of you will recognize her because she was on City Talk day after day after day coming in from COP26. Um, and then Noah Zahn, a great colleague that's uh, helping us from Springboard Policy, who's a founder and, and a fellow there, or principal rather. So thanks gang for coming on. We've had quite the time um, and we're gonna have quite the time tomorrow. So I appreciate you giving us a chance to, you know, I said to the gang, to this gang, when I invited them, I said, treat it like the post game show where we're gonna say, okay, what did we think of that play? And what about this? And so we sort of came in on challenges, solutions, actions, I think is the frame we've done. I'm gonna to go to you first, Noah, to give us a sense of what you've been hearing. And then I would really appreciate people that win the gold star for still being on with us um, in the chat to start putting in things that you think fit this kind of analytical mode so that we don't lose um, the edges that we're trying to push here and what the agenda needs to be. So Noah, I'll go to you first. And again, as I said, Please, folks, uh, volunteer into the chat thoughts that you've got. Go ahead, Noah. Sorry, just unmuting myself. So um, I'm taking Mary's uh, challenge seriously to uh, think about this as the after game show, I'm going to start out with a, a bit more of the play-by-play -play recap that'll help us set out the sort of color commentary and analysis uh, that can follow. Uh, and so our team's been uh, enjoying listening all day, and we've pulled out a couple of sort of cross-cutting themes that maybe we can use as a, as a jumping off point for uh, what we've heard and, and what we need to do based on what we've heard, uh, some of the good ideas and, and challenges we've heard. So we pulled out uh, three challenges that we heard, three sort of solutions that came out. And, and one call to action for us to think about both in this conversation and tomorrow, and of course for the, the days, weeks, and months ahead. So I'll just run through those quickly, but I want to uh, not, I want to let uh, folks uh, on this panel and in the chat, they had a chance to respond and, and, and add their takes. Uh, you know, the, the first challenge really uh, we heard in every panel is that every community has been hit differently. Uh, every, uh, Every city has been hit differently. Within cities, we, we heard the sort of uh, micro postal code level of the way different uh, economic sectors have been hit, but also from a human level, uh, different experiences in the pandemic, uh, whether you're, uh, you know, the sector you're working in, if you can work from home uh, or not, high income, low income, gender, uh, racial, uh, racialized community experiences. So need to think about our policy responses in a way that can be responsive to those differences. Uh, I'm getting already ahead into solutions, but that's the, the challenge we heard. Uh, we also heard a lot about the need to uh, the bring people back. And just uh, if we heard about transit volume still being a small fraction of uh, what they were pre-pandemic, uh, office towers uh, today uh, largely empty, but also not just employee uh, employees, but uh, students and, uh, and international visitors and, and domestic visitors. This is sort of a fundamental challenge ahead. Uh, and then when uh, Tim Richter was speaking in the context of housing, he talked about uh, leadership and intergovernmental leadership being like a uh, awkward high school dance where everyone's standing at the sidelines and somebody needs to step up and ask somebody else to dance. Uh, and so that, you know, characterizes the, the naughty intergovernmental uh, considerations here where we need federal, provincial and local leaders to and indigenous leaders to work together in ways that they haven't uh, haven't on most of the issues that we're focused on here. And so we're going to need sort of different partnerships and leaderships is uh, something we heard in a number of fronts. Uh, and to focus not only on challenges, but uh, the more optimistic, some of the solutions we heard cross-cutting, uh, reforming funding arrangements around cities and urban areas, uh, absolutely 
uh, moving from some of the short-term rescue to long-term stable operating funding for core services like transit, housing, and thinking about things like revenue tools to make sure that uh, for the medium and long term, uh, the money matches uh, the, the big challenges we need to face in sort of core services uh, and thinking about the engagement and accountability that should match uh, how we make, uh, how we spend our money on the things that matter. Uh, I heard in a number of fronts the needing to step up in leveraging data for better decision making that's more responsive, that uh, enables more innovation. Uh, across all aspects of our, our downtown's public, private, nonprofit services, uh, and uh, getting more targeted as a result. And uh, something a little bit more specific, specific uh, just building a lot more housing, which we could also think about as just thinking big. Uh, also in our housing conversation, we heard about the scale of the very large uh, national housing strategy still paling in comparison to the amount of housing that was being built uh, in each year for high growth times in you know 60s and 70s. Uh, so what does that mean as sort of our call to action for all of us that have gathered here together virtually uh, and in our work going forward? Uh, we heard a lot about uh, moving from uh, the current challenges to really thinking about the vibrant downtowns. Uh, we heard about making sure that people feel uh, safe uh, to come back, but also that people need to be lured back in a number of ways through uh, good services, through opportunities to live and, and work, uh, as well as uh, to make things fun. Uh, people have options now and employer uh, with hybrid and remote work uh, and people have considered or started to move elsewhere. And so uh, how do we make sure that people enjoy their experiences coming back uh, downtown? But I'll, I'll leave it to, uh, I'm sure others drew some other things out of the conversation uh, as well. Thanks, Noah. Um, I mean, as you say, we're just getting in the beginning of this sort of uh, trying to get some feedback. I mean, there are a lot of things that weren't said as well. And I'm anticipating that some of the folks that have been listening will nod their head and say, where was this? Where was that? Um, Shauna, you did uh, your own sets of consultations a couple of months ago about what the visions were for downtowns in, in around Vancouver. And I'm curious if you want to, if someone's just put into the chat the links to your reports, which is great. But um, I'm wondering if you want to reflect for a minute about what you heard through that process. And then I'm going to ask Nigel and Annika to reflect on what they heard today. Go ahead, Shauna. I thought what Noah had said, there's a lot of connectivity that the, the whole social infrastructure has been downplayed for so many years. We talk mm -hmm. about the bigger physical infrastructure. What's mm -hmm. been really clear through the pandemic and then through the crisis that we've been going through in British Columbia around climate change impacts and the flooding, the fires, is that the social infrastructure matters. Right. And one of the hardest things that happened through the pandemic in the early days is that we shut our civic assets. So we've just heard from librarians how absolutely critical they are for a whole range of reasons. Mm -hmm. And so that that whole idea of thinking through the city from the social to the physical and how we create those connections, whether through, through our building policies, whether through our transportation and mobility policies, also the whole issue of the extent to which the arts plays a really critical role came out over and over and over in our conversations. The extent to which people-centered opportunities for volunteering and connecting into community. Now, those are things that are about the very local place-based initiatives. There's also the bigger pieces that relate directly to federal policy. And Mary, you had talked in, in, in just, you know, is it appropriate for libraries to be to be funded out of uh, the property tax base. Well, there's a whole question about what we're, what is being put on the plates of cities at this stage. Mm -hmm. It's not just revitalizing Main Street. What has happened to those businesses that were on Main Street? Right. What's happened because of the climate volatility to our communities. Mm -hmm. and so there's a whole other question going on about resilience and what is the role of federal policy? And who pays for that, right? Who pays for that. And what are the, the tools that we have? And it's a really rethinking. I've never felt like I've been in a place that is more important right now that we rethink how we have been doing what mm -hmm. we've been doing in terms of our treatment of cities and, and the urban environment. I mean, do you think we've got an opportunity? I want to invite everybody to open their mic so that we're 
so that we can make it like an after game show. You should feel free to interrupt each other. And what about in this? Because um, this is really where we want to do some free willing. But what do you think, Shauna? I mean, what do you think the chances are that we could come out of this with a different kind of approach to these investments? And is it, is it, as, is it as simple as just, well, let's define infrastructure differently so that the federal government, when it funds infrastructure, understands that it's also going to fund libraries? I don't know. Well, I think that the infrastructure is a piece. Let's define resilience differently. Sure. Okay. So that we're not, I mean, nature-based solutions are a really important part of climate adaptation, but resilience is about dealing with the isolation, dealing with the integration, yeah. having emergency planning so seniors are not left in a flooding area and having no access. Well, did you know this great anecdote out of the libraries? I don't know whether we have any of the librarians still on, but we did a city talk on libraries early in 2020 and found out that the one of the systems had decided a couple of months in that it would phone all its card holders who were over 65, I think, or 70 maybe, just to see if they knew how to do the digital system. And so they deployed their staff to call them. And when they called them, the 68 year olds and the seven year olds said, no, no, fine, I've got that, fine. They were glad for the call because they just wanted to have a visit with somebody. And then the librarians started to say, well, you know, we're, and the staff came back to the directors and said, well, no, they didn't really need help getting online, but they wanna keep talking to us. So we're gonna keep calling them, wow. you know? There's just something about this, as you suggest, the connection, the way that we reach out to one another. Annika, you've been in here off and on most of the afternoon, and I know that you're one of the people that's listened and didn't hear certain things. Do you want to comment a bit on what you heard and didn't hear? Sure. Thanks so much. I, I heard an incredible amount of, of interesting and inspiring stuff, and it's been great to, to be with you all afternoon. Um, you know, maybe I'll just I'll, I'll say a couple of things first. I'm Shana, I'm really glad that you sort of brought it, brought back in that connective tissue piece because I think that's some of what CUI does so well, and it's it's one of the messages that I've kind of internalized in my own work too is thinking about the way the way we handle the connective tissue of of all the pieces of city building um, in a perennially cash strapped um, politically. Um, weekend <laughs> or week uh, environment. So I'm really pleased to hear that. Um, you know, I think that question of, of uh, hitting communities differently, um, you talked about the sort of equity piece and all of that. And I think that's really key. You know, we, we know that building back, um, we've lost businesses, we've lost uh, you know, a lot of small business. And I think that's something we can hear more about and maybe will tomorrow as well. Um, as I think Noah said, even by postal code, we know that the impacts are, are different. Essential workers, um, you know, where, where COVID has spread, access to vaccines, everything. Um, so there's that piece. Um, coming from a mid-sized city or sitting in a mid-sized city right now, I'll, I'll say that as well. I think that's a lesson coming out of all of this. Um, is again thinking through how you know what these different what these different opportunities and challenges are in different different size cities. Um, in some cases, the mid-sized cities are actually sitting in a really good place because you know the the down the downside or, or is is that housing prices are rising rapidly. The upside right now is there's an incredible um, push for investment and and I think real opportunity for investment and for doing that well. Um, including on housing, right? That, that there is more investment in this community than there has been in some time in housing and more interest even from those outside um, in doing some really creative and innovative things and the money is there to do it. So, so those are, you know, sometimes the, the mid-sized cities have a, a little bit of a different feel. By contrast, questions like transit are even more challenging here because we didn't have a vibrant transit system to start with. Um, so at the same time as there was a buildup and a lack of funding, um, including from federal, uh, with the federal level, um, you know, we're now we're now challenged with, um, you know, more reasons to scale back. And so those are the kinds of challenges we need to to think about. Um, you know, I think we heard some some about this, but I'd like to hear more, too, about the ways that we innovated during COVID that actually we don't want to lose sight of. Right. Mm -hmm. um, patios are an example. We the good thing. struggled to do that in so many communities for so long. And suddenly there they were restaurants and cafes. Um, I will slow down. Thanks, interpretation. Um, uh, I'm glad they don't just say that to excited. Me. I'm glad they don't just say that to me. They're saying it to you too, Annika, that the interpreters <laughs> are having company. trouble keeping up uh, with us. So just slow it down a bit. Yep. Patio is absolutely uh, an example of, of, of good innovation. Um, in many communities, bike lanes are another. So those kinds of pieces that, that have been uh, really positive. Um, I'll leave it there for now, but I'll just say I think there are some governance pieces as well that we need to, to that have really been highlighted in terms of how our municipalities deal with the connective tissue and some systems pieces that we need to look at as well, um, in particular on housing, but sort of moving ahead. Um, it's not just we, we know what the problems are and now we really need to think about how we get this stuff done. And some of that is regulatory as well. 
So I, I, I'll come back to the governance piece in a sec, but I also just do, don't want to leave completely the actual built environment of the downtown, because we did hear from people over the last couple of hours, concerns about how are buildings being used? Somebody just in the chat said, what about the spaces between buildings? Maybe this is part of where the regulation goes into it. Uh, can we can we embrace adaptive reuse, whether it's a an old uh, faith institution, or maybe it's an office building that you don't need all that commercial space for. Nigel, you're a person who has a very broad perspective about how municipal government has had to continue to change. And I'm wondering what your response is to some of this post-pandemic thinking. Are we gonna be able to adapt our physical fabric? Should we be? And how aggressive should we be at thinking about how that might work? I think we can. And so, yes, we can. Uh, the question, about how inclusive that discussion is, I think yeah. is an important consideration. So you brought up right in the beginning, the question of diversity and yeah. that's and, and inclusion and equity, all those, those notions about who gets to decide, who gets to be at the table to, to um, have the discussion, you know, what, are, what, are, what, are, what about homeless folk? What do they, or, or the houseless folk, how do they, you know, they are often considered to be, you know, like human detritus, you know what I mean? And yeah. they aren't actually part of these, part of these dialogues. Um, one of the artifacts of the day was, since I'm, I'm the last guy talking right now, I wrote a lot of notes and all of them are now oh. unintelligible, right? Because I was writing that. <laughs> and so I'm gonna have to wait. So I, I agree with everything that's been said. And so I have some meta themes I think that I picked up because everything I would say has been said. So, I mean, you're all off. You're all awesome. The whole day has been awesome. Um, one of the themes that where we started out, so I missed a bit in the middle, unfortunately. So I, I was there at the beginning of the day and, I, and I've been here for the last half day. You know, when I think one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is how we measure cities. Right. Mm -hmm. So I I saw a lot of hard quantitative data in the beginning. Yep, you did. And, right. And there was no room there for qualitative data. Right. right? So when, when we talk about have like who gets to be at the table and talk about the future of downtown, finding a way to intersect quantitative data and qualitative data, doing ethnographies of, of city dwellers, of downtown dwellers. I mean- Like who's actually there and what's the, we, we did get when, asked it. Exactly, like, the people- What's the composition of people? Yeah. yeah, and, it's, and the, the homeless and, and so on. So that's one consideration is thinking more broadly about what counts as data, right? So I think mm -hmm. that means we're not just, you know, I'm a computer scientist, so, right? So I'm all about gadgets and gizmos, but there's, a whole anthropological side here about about you know the ethnography of the city so that's one consideration the another the other thing that was just mentioned is this question about how to make um how to encourage governments to experiment and just try things right so the patios and you know outdoor seating all those kinds of things those are all brilliant ideas but they'll be forgotten Right. In, in, in two years after. Right. If, if we don't do anything, those things will absolutely be for, forgotten. And I think there's there's a space here for I think there should be some research done. And I think we I think there's a space here for um, like that experimentation doesn't come for free. You know, no. he, I mean, we, it would be great if he did. But I think we have to invest in the experimentation that government does, right? Who's so gonna, think, in, who, who invests in that, Nigel? I mean, you're a Canadian living in the US, so you have a particular perspective on this, but I hear you. We, we've so, all been sort of musing on this, that things I that were impossible. A, I, I think it comes from a different bunch of different places. I think it comes okay. from local government, provincial government, you know, federal government. I think it's, you know, and I think they all have a part to play in, in putting some of the money in. You know, local government is best positioned to be able to fund the people maybe mm -hmm. or maybe mm -hmm. not i don't know you mean to provide I mean, the staff yeah yeah right and then maybe there should be there should be innovation funds right so when you're huh. tying innovation funds to to tax dollars that's not cool so maybe that's not a place for for local government but maybe it is for the federal government or the, or the provincial government i say. mean would you would you go even further what about innovation zones i mean one of the questions as you say uh, uh how do you try things you know during yeah. the pandemic we were forced 
to suddenly try things. So they right. suddenly had to figure out how do we make roads available for people to walk in them? How do we do the patio thing? We tend to not be very open to that. We don't, pilots are very difficult to, to maneuver, but you're in the business where you've encouraged municipalities to do it. Do you have sort of suggestions for so our colleagues I think here? There's, but... there's, 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 there's a lot to this. So I think one of the things we got to do is move beyond pilots also. Like in my okay. way of thinking, I'm not trying to pick on you, but I think like pilots are something that you do because you have some space or time left over. Right, again, right, 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 right. You get some freebies from, from IBM. I think we need to be more thoughtful about that. And so we need to be doing real experiments or like, you know, they're experiments in that we're, we're playing with the built environment. You know, sometimes those, that, that language or those notions come out of um, like tactical urbanism. You know, like mm -hmm. tactical urbanism is an idea that, that has been played with at the edges of government, but government doesn't do that well you know, is, is something that is more easily done by civil society, but maybe we should, you know, maybe we should make space to say, you know, and maybe it is these innovation zones, but the question there of like, who gets to determine the innovation zones and who gets to have a say on what happens there. I think like these, these are all eminently doable is just, they were, we just can't do them in a knee jerk way. I think they require thought. I mean, there's a, a lot little of more intentional. Yeah. yeah Go know, ahead, Annika. What would you say? Yeah, I think this is this is a great conversation and the, the innovation zone thing I see coming up in a number of different contexts right now. Um, and it actually ties really well with a response I had to, to Nigel's earlier comments uh, when you said you said these innovations don't come without a cost. And I actually thought where you were going to go was the sort of the sort of opportunity cost of we do one thing and we don't do another. We move quickly. We lose something else. Um, and that's not where you went. But I think it is important to raise it to one place where I really see a need. And I think we can call it innovation. Um, is in the way we consult. And I know there's some interesting work happening in different pockets, Sean. I think your institute's doing some work on that as well. Um, we've been pretty active there too because we really see every institution in our community and across the country in comparable circumstances struggling with this. Um, we went from a kind of high watermark uh, in early COVID where state of emergency legislation actually allowed uh, municipalities to move forward without even council meetings, never mind Mm -hmm. a broader consultation and canceled a lot of the sort of normal consultation. Mm -hmm. Now we're obviously we've, we've innovated and we found ways for those things to happen in some cases in ways that are more accessible to others, but we're also more and more aware again, of who's being left behind and whose voices we're not hearing. And so I think when we look at even things like patios and bike lanes, there have been, you know, real, I think uh, legitimate concerns about who's not getting consulted, where bike lanes are getting put, um, you know, what the, what the impacts are on, on some communities who are often not heard. Um, you know, and then as we looked at things like innovation corridors and doing some really interesting stuff, um, there are not a lot of great examples of that happening in a way that really brings along the local community where they tend to be to be located. So I think, you know, this, the slowing down is actually a, a counter that, that's important as well. You know, I've, I've been thinking that we're a bit guilty of this because we tend to, we meaning the urbanist sort of club, in that we tend to sort of shorthand, oh, well, we did patios, we did bike lanes. But the truth of it is we also did things like we got public washrooms into parks and we got ways of doing, I mean, uh, in Vancouver, in, in, in Shaughnestown, they found a way to resettle people out of Strathcona and Oppenheimer Park in a very supportive way into, into more supportive housing and they were actually encamped. So I, I wonder if we have to ourselves start to find those stories Mm -hmm. of things that actually worked well, that, that were innovative mm -hmm. and that uh, can be instructive for us as we move forward so that we're not, and, and I don't know whether it's enough to get us over the aversion of risk that we just as Canadians have, but, but I'm, go ahead, Shauna. I was gonna say, Mary, there were examples. That was our starting point in Vancouver. We asked people, what was compelling in this period? What happened for you that was actually positive. We asked them what they were missing as well. And that was really fascinating. A number mm -hmm. of those things came up. I wanna go a little bit further. I wanna take it up a bit because I think that there is this point right now that we're in this really interesting moment around cities and the history of our relationship to cities with the federal government. And I think that that's come out so much through CUI's work in this space is that it is time, I think, to, to renegotiate that relationship. Now, I know we can't open the Constitution, or maybe we can, but, but this idea that cities having that direct relationship, that's, that idea that cities have the power, the, the, the important role that they're playing in the connection 
with citizens. And that's where I see it. You were talking in, in innovation and in, in Nigel and in innovation. Well, let's look <laughs> at innovation. Let's look at democratic innovation as well at the same time. And let's look at all of that through an urban lens. And can you imagine if this country started to think about the solutions of the issues that we're dealing with, with far greater an urban lens. And I think we would move so much more quickly and have so many more engaged citizens and residents pooling resources. So that's not just coming from government, it's coming from all of those other sectors, the leverage capacity that citizens, residents, people bring at a municipal level is so much easier, so much more flexible, so much faster and you'll ever see it at the provincial or fe federal level. And so, well, you you could also argue that the federal government got very involved in our lives through COVID. Suddenly, I mean, they suddenly were cutting big fat checks, and they were the lifeline. You know, we all were tuning in. I mean, I can't imagine another period in our lifetimes where we spent so much time listening to what the government of Canada was talking about. So, is there a moment, as you're suggesting? We know that this particular government has ambitious goals around climate and around housing and around equity and indigenous reconciliation. Is there a way for us to position um, municipal uh, uh, capacity as the way for those to actually be able to achieve this, right? Noah, have you done thinking on this yet? Did you pick any of that up as you were listening to folks today? I mean, you can see on the chat, there's a whole bunch of people here who want to go to urban development agreements or they want to go to a ministry of urban affairs, or they're wondering whether we need a governance shift, sort of along with he's asking. Yeah, questions. and I think we need to, it's, I, I, you know, when we're talking about the different responses of things we've done differently and innovated during COVID, uh, you know, some of the places that, that my mind goes are certainly federal, I mean, CERB and Q's and the various acronyms that have been the lifeblood of, uh, of bank accounts for, hu you know, humans and businesses. Um, have generally been federal. Most of those programs were developed from scratch. There's some good and some not as good in, across all of those. And we can, we can talk about those, but I think we'd want to think about both, you know, what is good and bad and what do we want to keep from those programs? Um, but also I think you're raising, what do we want to keep about the fact that the federal government played a direct role um, working with uh, not just provinces and, and local governments, but with banks in the case of like delivery agents for, for uh, mm -hmm. SIBA, the business loans. Mm -hmm. uh, what do we I mean, want there to do that? I mean, there are a bunch of relationships that have been established and we know that there are going to be all sorts of ways in which they'll continue to invest. So I guess that's part of the dilemma. Nigel, when you look at that, I'm sure that this, I want to go back to this idea of innovation. Um, do you have notions about this in the Canadian context? I mean, for instance, could we create innovation zones in downtowns? Could we alter the tax treatment, both at the municipal and the provincial level? Could we give HST, GST holidays for investments in downtowns? I don't know. Is there some way to rethink? I, I wonder about the future of ground floor retail period. And I, I, I wonder I about it certainly in downtowns. Is there a I way to treat it differently? Why not. I don't see why we couldn't. I think it would just require some thought. You know, I think everyone was very, I mean, say what you will, positively or negatively, you know, when, when Mayor Bloomberg was in, in New York and he was changing the, the, the flow of, of, of traffic and, you know, street widths and, those, and they just, he just did it. They just went and did it. I mean, you know, essentially that's what he was doing. I mean, he, he didn't do it in a very democratic way because that's his, that is his way. But um, I think it could, like those things can be done. And if we look, there's lots of um, examples, you know, in, in Western Europe, you know, Amsterdam does lots of really cool um, street festivals where essentially they're just um, for brief periods of time turning off regulation on chunks of roadway to, to try different things and, and Barcelona mm -hmm. has done this and so there there are models I think you know there's some really cool stuff happening in uh, in uh, Colombia you know so this is it's this idea of like experimenting with the with the physical infrastructure with roadways is has definitely uh, is definitely there, but it is like this this notion that, that it came up before the question about governance, and I think it's 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 harder to think about right because it's not roadways and curbs, but it is just as vital, and that's where the democracy happens right in terms of like how like who gets to decide right and who's at the table and does everyone get a vote you know and all those kinds well, of things. Well, can you can you answer some of those questions instead of just rhetorically asking them? I mean, what do you think that might be? Do we want 
I mean, we know that participatory budgeting, do we want to do something like that? Do we want to actually... Well, we want to go further than that. I think we want to... Okay, what would that be? So I think um, if we create an innovation, um, if we create the concept of innovation zones that are overseen, for the sake of argument, by an innovation department team, whatever you want to say, whose job it is to sort of work across local government and maybe maybe vertically as well, maybe, maybe to reach into the, into the state um, and to try different experiments about, about all those questions about governance. So maybe you, you assemble, you know, community, right, this community advisory boards. I mean, we know how to do that. I mean, but instead of just coming up with a plan, what if they were advising on, on the specifics about what's happening mm -hmm. and these experiments are being run, like not next year, but we're going to do them on Tuesday. And then and, and Nigel, could this be a fund? Could this be funded by all three orders of government? Could it be like easily. a kind of commitment that would be I signaled? I think so. As you'd as throw jurisdiction out the window, basically, right. and you'd I say, "Let's actually just way. let's you just solve some problems." Good at doing what, right? And so, right. like I was saying, so like in local government, if we're going to be doing the hiring, it makes sense for for us also to be paying for staff or maybe getting some support, maybe from the province on staff. Although that's often hard, but it's for the sake of argument, you know, maybe the funds for that work come from. I was about to say the state, um, uh, the province or the federal government, you know, and then we and then we think differently. I just think that different levels of government are just good at different things. I and mean, I think that as you say, so you know, you, you know where I see that, and Annika, I'd be interested whether you whether you respond to this. Where I could see this happening, and where we have seen it, and actually, I thought your city manager from uh, Windsor might have mentioned it today, but he he didn't very much, um, is in transit. That there are opportunities in smaller cities to do interesting small transit experiments. Mm -hmm. And it's quite hard. It's very difficult in a big city like Toronto to be able to do it because it's just gazillions and gazillions of dollars. But in the smaller communities, and I wonder also with housing, could we be actually doing some uh, experimentation on this in smaller, more constrained environments? Because you know that if, you, if it works, then it can be copied. Annika, thoughts on that? Because you're in Windsor. It, would would the city be, I'm talking about small C city, would yeah. the community of Windsor be amenable to trying some things? I, I think so. Uh, I do. I mean, I think, you know, mid-sized cities, I think also let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater because there's a difference between something like the size of Innisfil, which is where, you know, they did the yeah. Uber stuff, right? And and then thinking about mid-sized cities where I actually think it is feasible to have a, a you know, a functioning sort of more traditional transit system. Um, and I think actually that work has been done, which raises another question about master plans and, and sort of, you know, following through with the plans that we have in the first place um, and not throwing that sort of that whole innovation out the window as well. Um, but yeah, I think I think the room is there, um, you know, and I, I guess coming back to that question about the role for the feds, I mean, some of that is about renegotiating the political arrangement. Absolutely. But aside from that, it's also again, it's about what we do with the funding. It's about, you know, stable funding for some of these pieces, conditional funding in some cases. Right. So are we meeting climate targets, for example, mm -hmm. um, you know, is it sort of some of those other pieces that come into into um, you know, into municipal responsibility that, that could actually be tied to as a condition to some of that federal funding. Um, and I think, you know, if you're talking about housing, but maybe on transit as well, um, framing some of that funding so that it does support innovation, so that it's not just sort of core, uh, you know, on the federal, on the, on the housing piece, it's not just about building more, but about actually incentivizing that level of innovation, about incentivizing the connective tissue piece, so that you're, if you're doing housing and you're doing it in a way um, that that is also a climate win, for example, that's pushing on densification and reducing sprawl. There's a there's an extra win there, or there's something tied to that. So I think, yeah, absolutely. I think innovation um, has its place in all all of those spaces, and there is a role for the feds. It's just it's got to be sort of framed that way. I mean, the thing is, uh, Shauna, you're a pro at this in terms of sort, and in the climate world, I think you've had to be. That sector has had to be much more. You couldn't wait for governance to change. You had to get moving. And so I'm wondering if there's something about flexible governance. You know, we get a little hung up. Oh, no, no, jurisdiction, jurisdiction. But during COVID, we couldn't really. We nope. just had to start solving. Do you think climate is going to give us the same impetus where these kinds of more ad hoc, issue specific, put a, put a governance structure together and don't fuss too much about the constitution or anything else? 
Is there, a, I mean, it looks like you can do and again, it. I, I do believe that climate's the game, game changer here. This isn't, we don't have a lot of time to get this right. And cities are on the front edge of this. So mm -hmm. that is a game changer. But I also am really excited to see the kinds of tools that we've been working on. The center has been around for 20 years trying to figure out how to do this well. Uh, on transportation, I feel like we've finally got a confidence building table. We've learned how to do visioning, working together, people who hate each other normally inside the room together, really working through land use planning through the lens of health, equity, affordability, resilience. Like um, somehow the outcomes, outcomes, the outcomes you know, allowed them to work no, together? Really clear. Like what happened is we existed for six years to really help the mayors advance their vision on a livable region. We've actually had in, in Metro Vancouver, 60 years of consensus on what that, re you know, we were modes connected through transit in a sea of green, which is our agricultural land reserve, amidst a sea of blue, which is our mountains and our oceans. So that was our, generally our vision. Well, it started when you started to get populist mayors who got in because they didn't want transit or they didn't, they would get in on a transit issue. And so they asked us to reconvene. So we actually hold a table. We I've been convening it for eight years mm -hmm. with the likes of the mayor's council, TransLink, the active transportation people, all the BIAs, the, the environmental, like people that are screaming and yelling at each other outside of the room, but inside of the room, it's a love affair. They really look at how can we, how can we support? So right now there's a big ask on transit. I took a look at the ask and said, oh no, it's, it's crying. The sky is falling again. Uh-uh, uh-uh, transit's essential. It's absolutely been part of our whole response and recovery. Let's start and lead with how critical transportation is to the way in which the federal government has responded to this. Okay, pandemic. so relationships, connective tissue, trying some stuff. Trust. Create Education. trust learning together. So that's Great. one piece. The cities in COP26 was a completely different. It wasn't a confidence building. It was about strategy. It's how do we go into Glasgow together? And how do we get and speak together? Mm -hmm. How do cities get on the agenda of the climate, mm -hmm. national determined contributions or whatever we're going to say as Canada in Glasgow mm -hmm. and whatever's going to come out of that? Well, we got into the agreement. You couldn't really go anywhere into the blue zone in Glasgow without seeing cities. It mm -hmm. worked. And all of a sudden, for the first time, you've got all these cities, intermediate organizations going, oh, my God, there's such a clarity in what we're saying. And you mm -hmm. see that going into this federal budget. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. these processes work. And I just want to come back to something Nigel said. It's the processes of innovation of who's got a voice at that table and how are we shifting the traditional siloed policy work that we've done to something completely different, which is much more horizontal. And as you said, Mary, not worrying about the jurisdictions. We got something we got to do here together. Let's try and do it through deep listening and hearing where we all fit within the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. let's map it. You're doing this. You're good at this. You're doing this. Let's, so then let's move together. And then move together. Yeah. Uh, this horizontality thing. Nobody knows. Nobody does this well. Everybody wants to try. I think the horizontal piece we're learning. Um, we're going to try to wrap in the next couple of minutes because I'm conscious that we have people that are still with us for uh, six hours later and they want, they want to uh, break, obviously. Annika, over to you and then maybe to Nigel. And then last word will probably be you, Nigel. So go ahead, Annika. Yeah, I'll just make two final comments. I mean, the one is I think, it, you know, as, as we come into an Ontario and election year uh, for municipalities and provinces as well, of course, um, you know, part of the piece, I think coming back to that participatory budgeting, um, that public engagement piece is just, you know, the, the, the other elephant in the room is the low level of public engagement, the, the low level of public consciousness still, even though it's, I think it is changing about what cities do and how important a role they are, they have on all of these issues. Climate is a classic example of that. It's maybe the biggest one, um, you know, but pandemic, we saw it too. And on, you know, on DEI, uh, you know, what, what inclusive you know, placemaking looks like, how we, how we fit together in our communities, all of this is at the city level. And yet we have the lowest level of voter engagement of any level of government. Which is any weird. Levels of government. Um, so there's weird. that. And then I just, again, coming back to that accountability piece, master plans is something, and I hear this from my students, my law students all the time. Um, this has become a real preoccupation for them. How do we, how do we not only do the right stuff, um, 
and make the right plans, but how do we actually hold feet to the fire on implementation so that those plans weren't just aspirational and how do we fund it? Of course, that's where the higher levels of government could come in, um, but ultimately the, those people around the table have got to be held to account for, for the plans too. I, I, heard, I'm, I know that Noah's capturing all this because he's back with us tomorrow and we're going to try to build this nest together, but accountability and, and also you talked about conditionality earlier. So, and how do we actually reconcile those? So great. Uh, Nigel, last thought from you. You know, um, the one, one or two things that I heard that concerned me in the beginning of the day, more than once, I think we heard sort of euphemistically the notion of getting back to normal, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to do this and we're snap back to normal. Like, I just want to say, like, we got to throw that out. Like, normal didn't work for anybody. Normal was garbage already. And so we have to be thinking, it has to be a, about the future. And that means, right, you and I have talked about this before, like science fiction writers. Need Ministry be, of the future. Right, exactly. Let's do that. Um, the other thought that I think we should, we should, would be useful to end on is, is the collaboration across cities. You know, so is, is obviously, Geographically, cities are used to competing, right? Toronto and Ontario or, and, uh, and, and Ottawa and so on. But I think we have to get beyond that. Like we have far more to learn from each other. Mm -hmm. And when we approach these problems as a, as a block, as a group, you know, as we're talking about, you know, COP and then those things, is like we need to find a way to forge alliances that are long lasting across cities and, and, and across countries. But I think, you know, nation states, you know, do we need that anymore? Like I, we need to be, we need to find, if we're going to be collaborating across cities, I think we need to find a way for a global North city to connect with global South cities and, and, to, and to realize we all literally do, this is where the rubber meets the road. And so we and stand that's, more. Yeah, that's we, certainly we been one of the, yeah, that's been one of the extraordinary schisms we've seen around vaccine production and vaccine right. uh, distribution that the, the chasm between the global North and the global South. Well, next, next one, that's where we need to go. All right. Well, listen, thanks, gang. We're going to be back tomorrow. I want, just want to say a shout out to all of, there are several hundred people still on here. Thank you for staying on with us. We hope you have a good evening. Um, uh, we're always appreciative of our super participants. And Paul McKinnon, you win a prize because you've been on every session and active in the chat from Halifax. Thank you so much for being such a keen contributor to where we're going on the future of downtowns. Um, we'll be back tomorrow at noon Eastern. And just exactly what you were suggesting, Nigel, um, we're going to talk about cities working together because we're going to be joined by Mike Savage, the mayor of Halifax, who's the chair of the Big City of Mayor's Caucus, and Carol Saab the CEO of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. And we're going to start our session talking about that kind of collaboration of municipal governments and what the role of municipal leadership is. And then we go from that into sessions with people in, working in city government around economic development, then the chambers of commerce, uh, all talking about how they're collaborating across their different jurisdictions uh, for economic recovery. And then we have sessions on culture and animation in public space. And it's just going to be another great afternoon. Mm -hmm. uh, or have or morning afternoon, depending on your time zone. So thanks for joining us today. Thanks to all the producers at CUI, of which there are many, many, many in the background working. You know who you are. You're great. And uh, we'll see you back at noon Eastern, nine Pacific, one o'clock Atlantic time, 10 o'clock uh, mountain time, 11 o'clock uh, central time. How's that? Okay. See you tomorrow. Thanks very, very much, everybody. And you can go to our website if you want to see the program for tomorrow. It's at Canterborg forward slash city summit. And we'll see you when we come back. Thanks, Annika, Shauna, Nigel, Noah. Great to see you. See Bye. You